presented by Terrible Herbs to welcome into the Knights Report as we uh, spend our weekend talking hockey and going around the National Hockey League and talking the VGK and the Vegas Golden Knights. Uh, we are going to be joined by Zach Whitecloud in just a little bit. Uh, first year defenseman with the uh, Vegas Golden Knights in the National Hockey League, cutting his teeth. But uh, right off the bat, Gary Lawless, Shane Knighty, Stormy Bonatoni, uh, discussing things like uh, the rollback and uh, possibly ending the regular season at a 68 game uh, regular season as opposed to finishing off uh, some regular season games and then going into the playoffs if the season continues. We'll also flash back to year one and playoff memories from the Vegas Golden Knights uh, charge to the Stanley Cup final. And we'll finish off with a little bit of a stormy challenge as it's becoming known around the Knights report. I'm not sure exactly what we're going to be doing today. Stormy kind of keeps that uh, hidden and uh, springs us on it uh, on us uh, at the last minute. So I'm always looking forward to that. We did some coloring and some drawing earlier on, but uh, out of the gate, let's bring in uh, Zach Whitecloud. Zach, so uh, 16 games in the National Hockey League, uh, really uh, cementing yourself uh, in the first year. You've signed the contract extension. Uh, you've uh, playing for a first place hockey club, and now you're going through the COVID pause. Uh, I hope you're writing some of this down because it's been an eventful year for you. Yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, <clears throat> a lot of things going on for sure. Just kind of, as everyone's doing, taking it day by day. So, I mean, that's just what I'm trying to do. When you look at it, Zach, it has been quite the year. You think of the progression, obviously your goal was to make the NHL. Uh, what, what's it been like for you? you take mm -hmm. us you know, through since you came out of you know, college, signed with the Golden Knights to Chicago. Uh, just has it gone as you'd hoped, obviously now with uh, the contract in hand? Uh, well, looking back on it, I was, um, I don't think anything ever goes as we hope. Um, nothing's ever a straight line, right? It's kind of up and down and um, a little bit of a roller coaster here and there. And, uh, but coming out of college, signing with Vegas and then going through the development process and, and knowing that, you know, it, it wasn't going to be, it wasn't going to be quick to the NHL. And I knew that and going in and, uh, you know, I was completely fine with that. I knew I had to go through a development curve and whether that was one, two, three, four years, whatever it was, I knew um, if I kept uh, doing the things that made me good day in and day out that I was going to get my chance at some point. So, Well, and I know you're like a really big trust the process kind of a guy too. Like when you went through kind of your first real injury of your career this year, right? Like overcoming that and getting the, the, ultimate position that you ended up getting this year and now the contract extension as Darren mentioned just kind of how would you express your kind of season as a whole and kind of coming into your game and overcoming that yeah again a lot of ups and downs I mean um last year in Chicago we we made a good run to the Calder Cup finals and that you know went into I think it was like mid-June and and obviously I I had an injury then too that you know, only allowed me to get in a month of training and, and then coming into camp with, uh, you know, high hopes to, you know, land a spot on the team and um, going through one of my first major injuries like that, that kind of put me out of, I guess, the race as, as a lot of people kind of referred to it because there were five of us, you know, going for that spot and, um, you know, just having myself out of that was um, new for me. I had never um, experienced anything like that where it was just kind of taken out of my control. Um, that was the first time where I didn't have control over something like that. So uh, that was obviously a different experience and, and made me better for, um, you know, moving forward in my pro career. And, and then uh, went back to Chicago and, and got, you know, completely healthy. And it, honestly, I forget. Oh, it's falling out again. Um, <laughs> um, I, I've told a lot of people that it was kind of a blessing in disguise because it gave me time to rest from the playoffs the year before, um, whether I liked it or not, it, it was an opportunity for me to um, kind of build my body up again, um, give my mind a break and come back even. And I truly believe I came back stronger after that, that uh, four week injury period. So um, no, I took it for what it was and used that experience to the best of, uh, you know, to the best of my ability and then came out, uh, you know, better for it. Zach, I can remember back in the 2017, 18 season uh, starting to hear, around our scouting group, uh, Bemidji, a little bit. And I went on uh, the Bemidji State. And I never heard your name, but I, I heard Bemidji a lot. And then I went on the Bemidji State roster and I saw, looked around, and then I saw Zach Whitecloud, Brandon Manitoba, and thought, hmm, there's some connections 
uh, there. And then sure enough, uh, you were the college free agent that the Golden Knights signed that spring. And I want to take you back to Buffalo. You joined the team in Buffalo. It was an afternoon game. And just prior to the game, I interviewed you. And then you asked me for some paper and a pen. And you sat down in the press box and watched that first NHL game with you being a member of an organization. And you took notes for the whole game. And I remember looking over in the third period and the first, you'd flip the, the sheet over and we're writing on the second sheet at that time. Do you still have those notes? Well, first of all, did you ask yourself what a Bemidji was? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'd heard of Bemidji um, before. I go back to I, Teddy Belisle. I know Bemidji. Yeah, so, well, even my mom to this day, she still doesn't know how to pronounce the city. So, um, you got that up over her. Um, no, that first game in Buffalo when I joined, um, that was the first time that I, because I'd gone to NHL games before with my dad. Um, you know, we were close to the Jets, so we were only two hours away. And uh, that was the first time that I wasn't watching, you know, as a kid or as a fan, right? So I was actually there to, you know, one day contribute on the ice. And um, I felt it was important that I learned the systems as much as possible so that when I did go into practice, you know, I wasn't like, um, I wasn't like a wandering soul out there. I wasn't lost. And um, obviously the drills are new and everything like that. So you got to learn that stuff. But I think I felt if I learned the systems and, you know, when I did get my chance to go into a game, I wasn't going to be lost and I was going to be held responsible with um, obviously accountability to go out there and do the job. And um, I felt it was on me to learn the systems as much as possible because, um, you know, the coaches aren't going to, you know, go out of their way to teach you that. You got to be mature enough to learn that stuff and, and kind of take in what you're, what you're seeing and, and how the team plays, you know, how guys treat each other, um, different systems and things like that. Um, just learning how to be a pro coming in right away, right? So I had to learn a lot of things like that, and that was the easiest way for me to kind of do that. Do you still have the sheets? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. They're back. Uh, they're actually, awesome. actually, they might be in my suitcase in my room right now. So speaking of suitcases, um, when you get the call up uh, prior to the 16-game run uh, with the Vegas Golden Knights, I mean, Shane's been through this but do you bring everything with you or, or or how does that work out when you're going back and forth um a lot of so the easiest way i can say that is a lot of people in the hockey world are uh, superstitious um so kind of when i got called up every time i brought you know just one pair of like kind of going out clothes like going out for supper and things like that um and then obviously my suits and uh just some like casual wear to wear around the hotel or whatever and I never, I never packed a full suitcase suitcase because I thought if I packed too much, then the opposite would happen. I'd go back too quick. Um, <clears throat> and then one time it actually turned out I stayed up for, I think it was three weeks and I'd only brought those items. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was kind of recycling, you know, a lot of things and, uh, you know, a lot of clothes were dirty and I couldn't really go out in public a whole lot because <laughs> um, I was wearing the same clothes every time. So, um, no, I mean – as far as that stuff goes, you don't want to get in your own head too much. But um, for me, I just, you know, I packed the essentials and, and uh, I did a little bit of shopping, you know, when that second or third week, week camp kind of came along. So. So do you still have stuff in Chicago or is it all sent up? It's all here now. Yeah. I'm yeah. all in one piece now. <laughs> well, that's always a good thing. Uh, Zach, I have to ask you as a defenseman and I remember this, uh, you know, I, I spent more time than you uh, kind of developing in the, the American League and the old IHL. But as a defenseman, kind of when I knew I was going to make it was when I figured out that I call it that second, either that that extra second to make a play or the, the less second where you need to make it quick and kind of figuring out the difference between both. Because I think the, the, the biggest difference in the American Hockey League to, to the NHL level is – knowing when you have time to make a play or knowing when you don't have time to make a play. Have you, is that similar for you or what was the, maybe the thing that you, you know, you figured out the quickest uh, to make the adjust, uh, adjustment? No, I, I, I completely agree with you that um, that extra second or knowing when to make a play or, you know, when to put it off the glass as a demon, when to kind of relieve yourself of pressure and things like that. Um, and that stuff takes time to learn, right? Like, there are some situations where, you know, this year I've, you know, I turned over a puck and it came back and it almost, I'm lucky they didn't score on us. Right. And um, it's learning little things like that, you know, and I've always 
always been good at knowing who I'm on the ice with, whether it's, you know, guys like Connor McDavid or it's the first line or if it's the fourth line and, and knowing what certain things you can kind of do with each line, right? You can hold on to pucks a little bit more. You can make that extra play or, you know, you're not going to have time because guys are quicker. Um, but the biggest rule I have always adhered to is I've always played on teams with good uh, skilled forward groups. And I always use the, um, the term uh, puck on my stick, puck off my stick. Um, so obviously you look at our forward group right now. It, it would be stupid of me not to put it on their tape as quick as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's the way I, I was the same way. I said, as soon as it got off my stick, it was in a better position. Um, yeah, hopefully exactly. on our team. Daniel yeah, Alperson, exactly. Shane Knighty. Uh, you know, yeah. Well, that, yeah, I was fortunate. <laughs> I came in with a pretty impressive group in Ottawa, the, the early 2000s. Oh, no, yeah. And I'm, I mean, same. Sorry, Stormy. I just, um, and same with me too, right? You've got, you know, centermen like uh, William Carlson and and, uh, you know, guys like Riley Smith, and, and the list goes on and on and on. Mark Stone, Max Petrietti, Paul Stastny. When you're going as a D-man, when you're going back for pucks, those guys are, you know, directing traffic for you, and it makes your life a lot easier. And if I can get it in their hands as quick as possible, then that makes, you know, their job easier and my job easier as well. I just want to say there's so much Manitoba on this broadcast right now. Yeah. <laughs> so much. <laughs> but well, Shane, no, Zach, Shane and I were both born in Brandon. Zach, you were born in Brandon. Brandon Boy, yeah. yeah, and Gary, you're so, you, you're a Manitoba. It's been like 20 convenient. years there, Gary. I was Gary. born in Brandon, but I was only there six months. I'm an Ipua <laughs> boy. Ipua. And Gary, should we talk about Brandon when it's convenient? Go ahead, Zach. Should we talk about Brandon for the rest of the podcast? Yeah, Clear Lake. Let's go up there. <laughs> Tell oh, me yeah, all about it. I can spend a whole month up there, no problem. <laughs> Me one of my favorite things, I love that you already said supper in this broadcast as well, because that's one of like <laughs> my favorite words. <laughs> Do you call it dinner? I yes. call it dinner. I'm sorry. Like, yeah, I get, I get that mixed up. I get that mixed up down here all the time. I refer to supper and a lot of people think I'm saying like lunch or dinner or vice versa. Yeah, no, it's good. But one of my favorite things about you, Zach, just in general, is that whenever I have kind of an off the wall question, um, like you're a good person to go to in the dress room for me because even with the off the wall questions, you don't give me an expected answer at all. And one day we were talking about TV shows and you were shocked that I hadn't watched The Bachelor because you watched The Bachelor and you watched Grey's Anatomy and some other shows. I know you're a big Netflix, Amazon Prime guy. What are you watching right now during quarantine? Because I feel like you have the lowdown on all the good stuff to watch. Yeah, I actually made the switch. I, um, uh... I got an HBO subscription and I moved on to. Wow. Yeah. I made fancy. Switch. Is it yours or is it your mom's? No, it's mine this time. I'm a big boy now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my mom uses my HBO now. So it kind of. Oh. Um, no, so I, I watched Ballers and actually, so that has eight seasons. I got through that in two days. <laughs> oh my gosh. And uh yeah, it was bad. And uh actually so Revo and I were on the same series or the same season and I finished like twice the time that he he got it. So um that's how quick I went through that stuff. And then I started Game of Thrones and I'm on that right now, so I'm kind of making my way through that. Game of Thrones is one of my favorite shows, so you'll have a lot of fun with that. Just you mentioned Revo, just curious who are some of the other guys maybe that you've been keeping in the most contact with? I just keeping up with all the guys, obviously, in the group chat and, and things like that. And, um, you know, FaceTime group chats, you know, about different things and, and just kind of, you know, seeing everyone's face, kind of like reconnect a little bit. And, um, but mainly I just I, – I, I try to uh, – I saw – I think it was a tweet the other day. It was about, um, like, trying to FaceTime or communicate with as many humans as possible, like, face-to-face -face interactions, because it, it helps the mind and, like, kind of helps the soul a little bit. Um, obviously, because I'm, I'm down here by myself, right? So, you can only play so much Xbox and, and watch so much Game of Thrones, right? So, um, I, uh, I try to call home as much as possible, call my mom, call my dad, um, call my billet families back home in my junior hockey town, and... Um, or just call my buddies and have a FaceTime group chat just to kind of get that face-to-face -face interaction and, and uh, kind of get away from TV and Xbox a little bit. Who's doing the cook cooking at uh, the, in the, in the white, white Cloud House right now? Oh, it's all me, Gary. Come on. I know. <laughs> what are you cooking? Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of salmon, a lot of chicken. Um, I had pork chops last night. Not a big pork chop guy, but got into that. Um, 
honestly, the diet out of this whole thing, the diet's probably the hardest part, just kind of like managing that stuff and what you're putting into your body. And, and you kind of got to be more conscious of it because you're not, you know, skating every day and things like that. So, um, just trying to, you know, manage it and, and try, try different foods too. This is the time where I can, you know, order different things and then kind of go out of my comfort zone a little bit. If you're ordering, is there any, like, what are the places in, in Summerlin and Vegas that you like to dial up? Oh, I'm a big cafe Zupas guy. I really like that. A good salad and soup or a sandwich and soup kind of hits the, actually I've been craving grilled cheese and tomato soup for the past like three weeks. Um, I made grilled never... cheese yesterday. <laughs> did you actually? Did you yeah. have tomato soup with it? I did. <laughs> it's oh like one God. of my go-to meals. <laughs> Should FedEx one of those to me. Um, what else? Yeah, I've been craving that for a little bit. Um, Jenga, I eat Jenga sushi quite a bit. Um, that's one of my favorite spots. I mean, other than that, I don't really order in a whole lot. I like to try and cook and kind of be creative as much as I can. Cause what else am I going to do with my time? You know what I mean? So <laughs> what about your workout? What do you, uh, what are you doing? Uh, are you doing it all in your house? Is it a lot? Did you have a, did you have a bike set up? What are you doing to, to stay in shape? Yeah, I've got a few things here um, to kind of, you know, try and stay, I, I'm staying active every day. And um, one of the things that I found out is working out's a way to kind of get away and kill time. You know what I mean? Whereas in the summer, you know, you might have a day where you, you don't want to go work out because you want to go golfing or something like that. So now it's vice versa. And um, now, now I'm working out to like kind of kill time and, and get away and I'll find myself, you know, working out for um, two, three hours, you know, some days just to kind of kill time. And, um, you know, I take breaks from TV to work out and things like that. So um, no, just trying to stay in shape as best as possible and, and kind of give my mind a break from, you know, trying to obviously you're trying to stay self quarantine as much as possible. Right. So, um, you just try to find little, little things that help kill time. Are you using body weight or do you have a gym? Uh, I have a couple of weighted, you know, weighted things, uh, you know, got a bike here and, and things like that. So, um, you know, just trying to, uh, or no, not a bike, uh, like just like doing things on things on the ground, like cardio things like high knees and things like that. And, um, you know, you can go to the mountains a lot. That's a great workout too. So I've been doing that a little bit. Um, I don't know, obviously it's tough, right. As you know, as athletes, it's tough to, you know, kind of simulate what you would do in the gym, but, um, just got to handle it the best you can. Well, Shane and, and Stormy have done a great job in the BGK fitness challenge. You're welcome to join in with them. Yeah. yeah I've, get done in those on a, it, man. I've done those, a, done those a couple of times just to take breaks from again, like Xbox and TV. So <laughs> next time you'll have did, to send in your video. And no, I don't know if I'll do that. <laughs> Uh, it'll, it'll, probably, it'll probably catch me capping out at about 12 push-ups. So. Uh, the earpiece is staying in now. You've, you've mastered this whole TV thing. I don't know what's wrong with it. I, I just had a shower, so that could be the reason. I'm going to blame it on that. <laughs> uh, uh, why number two? And what was your number growing up? <laughs> um, well, I, I was assigned that number, so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get to pick. Um, but it's growing on me. I mean, I, I like number two. I, I mean, I'll... <laughs> All my friends and family have number two jerseys, so I, I literally can't switch. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of forced to stay with that. But, I mean, numbers don't really matter to me. Um, it's never really been a thing for me. I always – I switched all the time growing up. I, I went to 3, 29. And then actually in college when I hit uh, – when I got 32, because I was the youngest freshman going in, and I was ZW. Um, so I was ultimately last to pick my number, and there was that. There was 32 and – I think it was like 32, 13, and I wasn't picking 13. Um, and it was one on the number, but I picked 32, and my coach actually came up to me. He's like, hey, why'd you, why'd you take 32? I didn't want anyone to take 32. And I was like, oh, it's just different. Um, you know, it's just kind of like an underdog number. Like, no one ever takes it. And uh, he, so actually he ended up taking that number out of the whole jersey scheme when I left because he hated it that much. <laughs> and uh, – so I was the last one to wear 32, which is actually pretty cool, you know, for they retired, me. To, they retired your jersey. That's awesome. They, re, they retired 32. Um, yeah, they did, whether it was because of me or not. Um, no, I, 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 never, I never picked jersey numbers growing up. I was always just kind of given one. Um, I went, so I was five in AAA midget, uh, three growing up, um, 29 quite a bit. And that's really it. I mean, now, obviously now too. Shane, what was the weirdest number you wore as a defenseman? 
34. Yeah, well, that, uh, and that was, and my story was, was that I went to Ottawa and uh, every other camp I went to, you always got, well, now numbers are different. Back then, like, you had to go and you got your, your, your camp number was usually like, if your number is 70, 71, which is now a number, like, you know, they had strange numbers, number 85, uh, you know, 34 was the lowest I'd ever gotten going to a camp. And uh, when I made the team, I'm like, well, I'm going to stick with it. When they asked me to change, I was like, well, this is a good sign. And it's, uh, and I knew I wasn't, back then it was strange for not a, for someone either in a goalie to wear it, but I see Austin Matthews followed my lead. Yeah, there you go. One, one guy's got his number retired. The other one's got a first overall pick uh, following in his yeah, footsteps. I'm We're sure. in great company. Uh, this is great. Uh, Zach, uh, continued great health, and uh, we'll chat with you again soon. All right. Thanks for having me on, everyone. I appreciate it. Nice report presented by Terrible Herbst. Uh, Shane Natty having some fun laughing at me. Uh, Gary Lawless, stoic as always, and Stormy <laughs> Bonatoni. Uh, thank you. As we uh, delve into the National Hockey League a little bit, and two real scenarios coming out of the conversation this week is – uh, whether or not upon the uh, ending of the pause, we go to a 68-game schedule. That means a rollback, and uh, you go back to when all teams played 68 games and take the standings and move forward straight into the playoffs from that uh, idea. Or you play a couple of regular season games, two, three, four, five, take your pick. You're probably not going to get to 82, and then go into the playoffs. Uh, what uh, preference do you have, Shane, if, uh, if the National Hockey League chooses one of those two going into the uh, end of the pause? Well, I, you know, part of it does depend, you know, when everything can be clear. But uh, to me, I, I'm, I think you go straight to playoffs. I think everybody's on the same level, uh, you know, playing field. Unfortunate for some teams that were in the hunt or in the fight to get in. But uh, we're in unique, uh, unique times. And uh, it's not going to be perfect uh, scenario. But uh, I think Sidney Crosby, who, you know, right now I think is one of the lead voices of the NHL, that was – uh, his preference to jump right into playoffs. Uh, the only thing is they'd have to find a way to simulate some game action for each team. But uh, my preference would be to see them roll back, go to the 68 point percentage, however you want to do it, and, and jump right into a playoff scenario. Gary. I just thought it was I, – sorry, I just thought it was interesting that the, the 68 rollback or where the games were played through points percentage would still be the same teams getting in. That's all I thought was just interesting about the rollback. Great point. Yeah, I guess, you know, any way you look at it, I think that Shane makes the most salient point, and it's going to depend on the virus and how much time is available uh, if and when we get to this situation. But that being said, uh, I don't like the idea of taking games off the board. And I also, you know, view it as the schedule. Certain teams have, re you know, really paid the price with road schedules or uh, time zone issues earlier on and then you know to now maybe some of those teams are in a place where they've got four or five home games in a row and an opportunity that you know to get back into things so and I also think you want to play some games before you know, flip the switch on the Stanley Cup tournament so I'd love them to get to 72 74 somewhere like that play a few more games right now there are drawbacks to that too because you know, it, for some teams, those first couple of games for Vegas, for instance, those first few games to get to, say, 74, they're tune-up games. For a Winnipeg or a Nashville, those games are play-in games immediately. And, you know, that's kind of a, a disadvantage for those teams. So any way you slice it, it there's going to be pros and cons. But uh, I love the idea of a little bit of action before the playoffs start and also giving everybody an equal opportunity to get to a number like 73 or 74 or 72. I don't like the idea of games that were played being erased. Oh, I have to check on Alexander Ovechkin too and how many uh, goals he scored. Uh, I mean, it, it, I don't know whether you take those goals off the board, but uh, the idea yeah. of, uh, yeah. of uh, teams coming back that are out of the playoffs – coming back for a couple of games, knowing that they have nothing to, to play for, uh, that's going to be a, that's a challenge too. So uh, there's no, there's no perfect answer, but 68 in a rollback or playing a couple of games appears to be the conversation that's uh, dominating everybody's attention right now. This is the start of the playoffs uh, or would have been uh, in the national hockey league for 2020 under normal circumstances. So it got us talking about our favorite memories from year number one. And we come at this from very different perspectives. So uh, we'll go, 
oh, to closest to at the time and that run of the Stanley Cup final that uh, Shane Addy and Gary Lawless witnessed firsthand with the Vegas Golden Knights. And then uh, Stormy and I will uh, fill in from our, uh, our vantage points. But uh, Gary, uh, what uh, stands out to you as you look back a couple of years from that marvelous moment? Well, that night in, in Winnipeg, game five, it was really weird for Shane and I. We had worked, I had worked in Winnipeg for 18 years. Shane is a native Manitoban, uh, born and raised there. And uh, we both worked on the Winnipeg Jet broadcast for, uh, for a number of years. And uh, to, to go into that city and feel the whiteout and go through everything that, uh, that, that we'd been through that season and then have it uh, culminate with uh, a win and winning the, the Western Conference uh, championship. I think I got this thing sitting on my desk. Actually, this is kind of cool. That's what they uh, that's what they handed out that day to uh, to the Vegas Golden Knights. And that was uh, I remember I took the elevator down with Mark Chipman, who owned uh, the Winnipeg Jets, and uh, I just stared at my shoes. I didn't look at them. And then as uh, we got off the elevator, uh, we both stopped and uh, shook hands. And then uh, I went around the corner and. Uh, First guy I saw was Kelly McCrimmon, not exactly a big hugger. And uh, we uh, had a big hug. And then Shane will remember this as well. This is one of the classiest things I've ever seen. When we got to our bus, yeah, we to the plane, Kevin Shevel Dayoff, the general manager of the Winnipeg Jets, was waiting there, shook Shane's hand, shook my hand, and then uh, said, uh, I, need to, I need to see George and I need to see Kelly. And uh, wanted to wanted to, to congratulate uh, George McPhee and Kelly McCrimmon. So, uh, look, look, you just asked me that question. I just rattled all that off. Uh, that's a, a vivid memory. That night at the Chandelier Bar was pretty good at the Cosmopolitan too, Shane. If you remember that, I do. Oh yeah, uh, I wasn't. Uh, I was there a while. Uh, I was with <laughs> Gary. It is. You know, there's so many moments from year one uh, and that playoff run, but, uh, you know, it, it's the Western Conference. And obviously the ties for me, uh, I'm a competitive guy. It was tough going. It was like I dreaded that that matchup would happen. Having just worked in Winnipeg uh, since the team came back from Winnipeg, started my broadcast year covering that uh, team. Uh, all my buddies, uh, a lot of the fans, uh, you know, walking from the, the arena to the hotel, uh, uh, some people, I got chirped, uh, absolutely by people. Most people were good to me. Um, and then I knew it was, it, when I was, I usually am not a fan and everybody knows this about me. I've never like in any sport had a team, never been a diehard fan, fanatic, or, you know, I, as a player, I lived by winning and losing and I took losses hard. Um, this was the first time I think I was that emotionally attached to a team winning. Felt like I was a player because I would have dreaded it would have been a long summer for me going back to Manitoba and having not been on the winning side. So I was them winning that Ryan Reeves scoring. Uh, it was it was pretty you know for him to score who was probably going similar things as Gary and I being from Winnipeg, the the Western Conference winning goal. It was a great summer. I remember going after games, uh, win or loss. I'd be with my buddies. They'd have his, their Jets jerseys on. They'd take it off when we were in Winnipeg. Uh, <laughs> but it was a good summer of me chirping them. It was a fantastic summer. Did you chirp the fans that were uh, giving it to you on no, the way to the ring? No, no, no. They, you know what? That, that's the, the minority of them. The majority of the people there are great memories in Winnipeg. Uh, the, and that Jets organization was tremendous to me. So, uh, you know, everybody, that's just their passion, right? Uh, they were upset that, uh, that I left for Vegas uh, and probably upset uh, that I was there. But other than that, that's just the minority. Everybody else was – the majority of them were fantastic. The only reason why I asked that uh, and put you on the spot was because you were voted the best chirper on a broadcast pool oh, the other day. Uh, by, I don't uh, chirp. By us I'm, on I'm a kind report. person. <laughs> uh stormy where were you and what do you remember <laughs> yeah i just say on that comment i beg to differ um <laughs> i was in charlotte north carolina um watching this season unfold and as a las vegas native obviously i was a big fan watching the whole year and 
like for some of those games, um, I was working at NBC News Channel um, as one of my many uh, media jobs out there. And I was like editing and writing scripts for just a bunch of different things. And they gave me all of the Vegas games, which was so awesome for me. Like if I, I was either watching at a bar, watching at home, or I got to work on them writing scripts like for each game. And for me watching them, like, you know, we weren't supposed to have a good team. They weren't supposed to make the playoffs, win around, certainly not make the final. And so for me, like the biggest takeaway as a viewer was every single game I got chills, whether it was like the the beginning of the game, a moment in the game after one was over, it just everything about that run just gave me chills for so many different reasons. It was just that was the misfit team, you know, unwanted in so many ways. They were a never satisfied group, constantly working to get better. And then I remember um, the sweep of LA. I don't remember if it was at the beginning of the series or the end, but our Twitter account tweeted like something along the lines of started with no players. Now we're here. And <laughs> I was just like, it was just, it was so cool. You know what I mean? It was just unheard of. It was just yeah. so, so improbable and great. Yeah, you're right. That's that series against LA from uh, from my vantage point, looking from the outside uh, in, was uh, was staggering. Not allowing the, the any goals, any uh, any production from from the LA Kings. You think, geez, if, if playoff hockey, like that's playoff hockey. That's not just surviving. That's that's getting it done. And if they can do this, maybe there is something here more beyond just the Cinderella well, regular season. Well, in that first game, like the the goaltending was so good. Jonathan Quick was like third star, and they lost. You know, like it was just, it was great. Very different uh, perspectives, but uh, all the channels towards winning. And that, that game one in Winnipeg, when the Jets were so great in the first uh, first period, and and you wondered what, whether it would get out of hand. And the Golden Knights, not just bouncing back in game two, but were so good, uh, just stemming the tide and stopping uh, the momentum in the second half. I thought that set the tone uh, as well in that uh, second half. So there's some memories from uh, year number one. And the uh, the playoff run, storming. It's become known as the uh, the uh, the game that's taking hold of uh, the night's report. Uh, Stormy <laughs> surprises everybody with a little game. What do you have on store today? Well, I have three quick little off the wall questions. One of them, our first one, I had you all take a look at it already, so you could decide. We'll throw it up on the screen. Choose your VGK quarantine house. So a lot of the fans were going through each houses and deciding who they would want on theirs. So Gary, let's start with you. Who is your VGK quarantine house? Yeah, I'm going with house four for a couple of reasons. Jonathan Marchessault is really fun to talk to. Paul Statsny, uh, I've had some of the, my, my favorite hockey conversations with him. He's a real student of the game. Uh, but with Marchessault and Nick Cousins in the same house, there would be like you just you would just stand back and watch them chirp, and eventually it would it would, uh, it would it would devolve into violence at some point in time. So you'd have all, all kinds You're of entertainment. Saddest. You'd have all, you'd have all <laughs> kinds of entertainment in that house. Wow, Darren, what about you? Uh, so I looked at it and went house number two, Alec Martinez. Uh, he's a neat freak. There's no way. That, uh, that I'm going in on, on that uh, route. Uh, house number three is Reeves in England. Too tough, I get on their nerves and they beat the heck out of me. So I'm not going <laughs> down that path. So I went with uh, with house number one with Stone and uh, and Holden, Theodore and Nosek. I thought it was a good mix where I, I wouldn't irritate them too much. There's enough conversation and uh, a mix of uh, fun and and some hockey talk. So I went, I went house, number, house number one. Plus, Tomash told me that, like, one of his dreams outside of hockey was to, like, own a restaurant one day. So maybe oh. he could, like, make you some good food, too. Yeah. I, I just looked at Martinez. I went straight there, found out which house he was in because... Like, you said no. <laughs> there's, it's, it's, like, when you talk to him, he's, every, there's a stool, like, slightly ajar. He knows when people have been to his house or moved stuff around. Like, it's, it's really dialed in. So there's no way I'm, I'm doing that. Plus... That house is dangerous, flurry pranks, you don't yeah. need it. What about you, Shane? <laughs> uh, it's an easy one for me, uh, house number three. Uh, Derek Dingler, well, he's closest to my in age, probably, out of everybody. <laughs> All uh, the tough Will guys. W William Carlson, uh, I got to know him over in Stockholm. His parents, uh, they could send, his mom makes the best uh, homemade cinnamon buns, so maybe we could get those. Uh, I know it's a long way to come uh, from Sweden. But, uh, and then uh, Revo, well, I know he's got a good supply of what I like, 
Uh, and then Nick was <laughs> the young guy, uh, you know, Fr I, hey, he's French. He's got to know how to cook. He's got maybe got some good uh, French cuisine. So uh, that, that's certainly the, that, that's the hands down house for me. I love this. We all picked different houses because I picked house five. Like, I think that that would be the most entertaining one overall because like Schmitty's hilarious. He's always got something going on. Alex is a funny talker. Zach, we obviously had him on the show and he could play board games with me, t teach me cribbage, all yeah. these different things. And then Chandler, um, I could finally learn how to have hat games. Like, I don't own many hats. Maybe he could show me how to get good hats. I don't know. I picked house five. So everybody had different ones. I think it's very Question important too, Stormy, that, that Gary and Shane are in different houses. Yes. Actually, I think we all need to be in different Shane houses. And I picked each other as uh, the guys we'd want to room with. Yeah. Recently. Yeah. No, that's, I, somebody actually commented on the, the original tweet of this saying like, okay, you're non-player house and like picked some of us, like who would be their like broadcaster house and stuff. I thought that was funny. My second question, Gary, I think you already answered it in the show, was the most interesting thing you can grab right now that's within your reach, the most interesting thing you have on your desk <laughs> that you could show us. Hmm. Oh no, it, you would think that it would be that, uh, but it would actually be this rock because <laughs> my dogs, I paid 1200 bucks for this last year to get a tooth fixed. They chew rocks. These, uh, <laughs> they go outside, they come back in, they come in, they curl up at my feet and they chew rocks. Wow. Never thought I'd hear that one. I that was, was not what I expected. when you said $1,200. <laughs> Who next? Who wants to go next? What's the uh, question? Most Something that you thing. can reach right now that's interesting. <laughs> I, I don't, don't know if I want to answer that. I know what Shane <laughs> is. <laughs> I've been in Shane's house. I know exactly where he is right now. Uh, where are you? The only quiet place, the, the guest bedroom. So uh, you know, Shane. <laughs> uh, what do I have? It's not much. I got, I got a coffee cup. There we go. I can't start my morning without it. And it's right. even the gold. This is the, the cool one that coffee cup and pillows. As this one get, heats up, it uh, turns into a scene. Really? You're taking work from home way too seriously doing this in a bed. <laughs> it's the only yeah. quiet place here. Darren? Wow. Uh, I have a bunch of uh, beat up snow globes we were unpacking last night because we just moved into our house. And uh, my daughter connects snow globes, and we lost, uh, we lost eight of them. And we're trying to figure out how we can get a snow globe from Germany and Boston and where else, uh, Chicago and Iceland. We're trying to, trying to figure out how we, uh, how we replace them. Oh, and Ireland, and Ireland. Okay. Right. So that's, I, uh, was, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to prop up the computer so that it's at a good like broadcasting level and was grabbing a bunch of stuff and I just yeah. left the rest of them on here. And one of the things I was using was the- Oh yeah. Vegas. Makes you feel like you're at the game from home. Hold on. I missed that. Yes, I missed that too. <laughs> that should be an alarm, like that we wake up to. Yeah, I know it's nighttime, Just but it should be. Bruce Junior. Yeah, yeah, You're get old. get you going in the day. So flip that is, up. I know this is Stormfront. That's the, that's the name of this game, and uh, so. Uh, uh, I, I shouldn't be allowed to ask a question, but I asked, I interviewed Jonathan Marsh so uh, last night for a Q and A and I, and I asked him what's in, just because Shane said, I missed that. What is the, the first thing you're going to do when social distancing is over? I know what Shane's going to say. I'll, I'll go to him last. Mallard, what about you? Uh, go for a skate. Okay. Get the, get the Friday hockey going. All right. Stormy. Uh, hug my grandpa. I know that sounds silly, but like, that's something like I really, I'm in Vegas and I, I haven't really got to see much of my family during this time because we're all staying away from each other. And so I really miss my grandpa. <laughs> Very sweet. Shane. Well, there's a long list. <laughs> Just I want to know if you're the same. The, the, the travel. The travel. Please. I, you know what? I'm, I might get kicked out before I'm allowed to leave. Yeah. Uh, I, there's a, when we go on the road, there's a, we get, we fly into town 
and take the bus to the, the hotel and there's a text that comes out about five minutes later and it's either got a location or meet in the lobby in, in five minutes or 10 minutes. And uh, uh, in Nashville, uh, when we get there in the middle of the night, you got to be in the lobby in two minutes or you miss some of the traveling party. Yeah. They're already gone. But uh, yeah, that text that says, uh, meet me, meet us in the lobby in five minutes and, uh, and the walk over to a, a restaurant or a watering hole. I'm looking forward to that big time. Yeah. I'd also, you know what, I look forward to just being back in the office with all our Golden yeah, Knights organization sure. people because yeah. we always, there's always someone to talk to and I enjoy just spending time at the office. So I, I look forward to that again with everyone back. I, even I like that forward, question. I even look forward to being mocked by Shane. It's not I mocked. I don't. Oh no, it's mocked. <laughs> It's mock. It's it's love. He's he's. It you is. know you're accepted. It's like grade seven again. Yeah. You, you I don't look accepted. forward. I don't look forward to all of the napkins and swizzle sticks and random things that will be put in my jackets and purses from Shane Knightley. <laughs> oh, the prank. Yeah, it's tough to do virtually. <laughs> uh, hair, uh, haircuts too. on there too. <laughs> <laughs> really? Uh, Looking like Kramer. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Uh, thanks I'm going to leave the show like this. There we go. Gary Lawless, Tony Bonner, Tony, and of course, uh, Zach Whitecloud. Uh, this has been Knight's Report, presented by Terrible Herbs.